Elderberry. So you want to talk about a medicinal powerhouse. Elderberry is way up there on my list of number one plants for everybody in the mid-Atlantic to be connecting with and aligning with and helping to promote and propagate. Um, this is just an absolutely incredible plant and I think that elder is a very appropriate name for it because this is, uh, this is a very wise being that is capable of adapting to all kinds of different situations. Oh snap, you got another one. See, this, this dude's a master forager. Don't let him fool you. He could lead this walk himself already. Yeah, there's another one, buddy. So uh, these elderberries, so this is Sambucus canadensis. Uh, this is in the Adox ACA family. Used to be in the Caprifoli ACA family, the honeysuckle family. And um, I only say that uh, to highlight that uh, this flower, these flower clusters form in umbels. So umbel, just like an umbrella, means that um, all of these uh, pedicils or uh, that's the specialized name for the stem of the flower is the pedicil. So all of these pedicils or flower stems connect to a single point and that's, a, that's an important identification feature there. Um, there are some other plants that closely resemble elderberry. Uh, there's all kinds of different viburnums that, that very closely resemble elderberry and they do have flowers and fruit in clusters and their fruits are uh, dark purple little berries and so there can be some confusion there. Mostly they're edible or medicinal so it's not going to be like you, you poison yourself or something if you get it wrong. Um, but they're just not nearly as medicinal as elderberry and not, they're not medicinal in the same ways. Um, so to get, to get the accurate identification on elderberry, one of the big distinguishing features is these leaves. And I want you to notice um, that these leaves are formed opposite from each other on the stem. So. What do I mean by that? I mean there's one leaf here and then directly opposite there's another leaf. And to make this totally clear, this is a leaf. Each of these smaller leaves that you see on here are what is known as leaflets. And so this is what is called a pinnately compound leaf because it is. this is a single leaf composed of an odd number of leaflets. So this would be called odd pinnately compound. And pinnate just means feather-like, as opposed to palmate, which would be palm-like. And you know, uh, an example of that would be like um, cassava is a great example of that, of a palmate leaf. Or uh, for those of you who are familiar with uh, cannabis leaves, cannabis is a great example of a of a palmate leaf. Um, buckeye, if any of you know buckeyes or horse chestnuts, that's another great example of a palmate leaf. Um, but so the elderberry has opposite pinnately compound leaves. And then the other big identification feature I look for with uh, the elderberries is that they have these big pronounced lenticels and um, as soon as I step away or, or as we go on to the next plant, I would invite you all to get a close up and look at these lenticels. When I say lenticel, um, that's these little bumps on the stem and those bumps are a part of the plant's gas exchange process. In the winter when it doesn't have any leaves, it relies solely on the, winter, on the lenticels for breathing. These, these plants are breathing even in the winter time and uh, they need to release gases and so they do that through the lenticels. Um, the berries are very edible um, and very medicinal, but the entire plant, berries included, do have uh, a class of compounds called um, HCNs or uh, hydrocyanic acids. 
These are cyanide-based compounds that are uh, pretty toxic in the sense that um, they can cause nausea, vomiting. I mean, everybody's familiar with cyanide poisoning, right? So with cyanide poisoning, um, you are numbing the cells in your body. You're numbing your body on a cellular level. It, it actually uh, prevents mitochondria from being able to um, consume ATP. So it completely stops biological functioning in your body. And uh, the, the earliest symptoms would be nausea, diarrhea, vomiting to clear the cyanide. Um, if you consumed too much of it, though, it would completely stop your respiration. Um, that's part of why uh, we use like black cherry bark in, um, in cough syrups because there is a, there's a cyanide-based compound in that as well, and the cyanide acts as an anti-tussive in small amounts. So that's important to know. Um, but being that it is cyanide, cyanide is a very volatile compound, and so it can be cooked out very readily. When I'm working with elderberries, I like to uh, mash up the berries and just barely cover them in water, and then boil them for at least 30 minutes. And if you boil them for 30 minutes, most of the toxicity should be gone at that point, or well, all of the toxicity should be gone at that point. Um, you can continue to boil them further to just make it more and more of a concentrated kind of medicine. And um, the leaves and roots and stems are also used medicinally. I would refer you to uh, Stephen Herod Buner's book, Herbal Antivirals. Uh, to get more information on that. I've never worked with the leaves or the stems. Um, I might this year because he feels that the leaves and stems are much more potent. They've been used in Asia for thousands of years very successfully. And, uh, you know, so if you follow the right protocols, it can be totally safe. But the leaves, the leaves and stems are going to be much stronger. And, um, this is a plant that is antiviral and what it actually does is uh, either I guess you could say it kind of melts off the spike proteins that viruses use to bind to cells and it actually has been effective as a treatment for coronaviruses um, that have a, a similar spike protein to the one that we're seeing with uh, COVID-19. And so that's interesting and may be promising as a preventative. There's also a lot of talk about this one because it has been found in certain studies to increase the activity of uh, TNF-alpha, um, interleukin-6 and 8, and some other uh, inflammatory, pro-inflammatory cytokines. And with COVID-19, one of the issues that we run into is these cytokine storms where there's too much white blood cell activity in the respiratory system and it clogs up the works and we basically drown ourselves to death with hyperactive uh, immune reaction. So all that to say, uh, you know, this might be a great one as a preventative, but we might should like ease off of it if you start to develop symptoms. So, but you know, again, with all this, there's an infinite amount of research that can be done around just elderberries alone. This is such an incredible plant. One of the other things I love about this plant, just to throw it out there, is that it can be propagated by cuttings very, very readily. So we can cut just one of these branches and make 30 more plants just by cutting it at each node. So like, for example, on this branch here, this could be one plant, two plants, three plants, four plants, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen plants from just this one little branch. That's not even including if we go to the bigger branches. And to give you an idea of how fast these things grow, I took this cutting and stuck it directly in the ground at the beginning of not last season, but the season before. Yeah, so Sambucus canadensis, uh, elderberry, one of the definite, definite superstars of this area. And 
and definitely a great friend to bring in, especially because it's so appropriate in so many landscapes. I mean, it only gets 10, 12 feet high. Even homeowners with small little yards can tuck this in a corner and enjoy the beautiful white flowers in the early summer and enjoy the berries and make medicine and wine and elderberry pie and uh, jam and preserves and, and so many awesome things, sodas and kombuchas and all of that. Cool, cool, yeah, elderberry, number one. Sambucus canadensis.